Well, it's my joy tonight uh, to introduce our, our guest. He's going to be with us this weekend, and um, he doesn't know how much he means to me. Um, I loved him so much that Talitha and I would watch. Uh, they had a pug. They had a pug named Roxy, and I hated that dog. But because I was the lowest man on the totem pole as the junior high pastor, uh, when they would go out of town, he would, I would go over to his house and I'd get Roxy, and I remember he would say, don't let Roxy die or Kim will kill you. Um, I was like, okay, they didn't tell me that this dog does not like to use the restroom on grass, that Roxy likes to use the restroom on concrete. And so I walked this dog for two hours one day in the park to where it just laid down and looked at me like, nope. Finally, finally, right in front of my door, decided to enjoy itself uh, immensely. And I hated that dog, but I loved him. And so Roxy stayed alive. I don't know when Roxy died or who was responsible, but it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And then they finally got a real dog, a bulldog, um, which is amazing. Uh, Random facts about Ben and Kim. Um, I'm going to go ahead and welcome Kim because I know Ben, you'll probably introduce her, but this is Miss Kim Daly. This is Ben's beautiful wife. And she decided to travel with him this weekend, which we're excited about. Um, when I met Pastor Ben, I was the junior high pastor. Uh, actually, I was an intern, and he came in, and the, the day that he started, he's like, we need a junior high pastor. And I had been serving there uh, for three and a half years, and he's like, just just change your title. Um, and I was like, can I change my pay? And he's like, just change your title. I'll remember that. No, he, he actually is the first one. The first label I had as pastor came under his ministry. People don't realize the transition that we went through here at the church, that uh, how I walked in the transition, what the staff has said, what my closest friends have said, the, the word honor, that we honor the legacy of those ahead of us, and we honor those that are serving with us, that this culture of honor uh, that I walked in was actually found in his footsteps. Because I watched him as he transitioned Pastor George's church in Irving, Texas, Calvary Church. And I remember watching him that as, as people encouraged him, he honored Pastor George. As people discouraged him, he still honored them. And Pastor George, as people spewed hate against him, he still drove through the mess and frivolity of humanity because he was on a mission. I didn't know that, that a decade later I would be standing in the similar shoes that he stood in, having to deal with the criticism for people, the stress uh, from the predecessor, and then, honestly, some of you, you're here and I love you, but I forgive you. <sighs> They're probably not here, just so you know. I learned a spirit of humility and honor from watching Ben and his ministry and what he went through. And I'm forever indebted to that. And he has no idea of those nights where I just wanted to fight my father, fight church members. I wanted to blow up. I wanted to give up. And I wanted to move uh, back to Arizona or Texas. I just remembered the, the spirit that he carried, the hardships that he went through, and where he stands today, where he has taken Calvary uh, from a church of a few thousand to a church of tens of thousands under his leadership. It has leading a revolution inside of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And he has a plan to take over the world, but we're going to beat him to it. Amen? Would you please welcome my pastor, Ben Daly. Why don't you clap your hands and give Jesus praise. Come on, somebody. Wow. Come on, you can do better than that, church. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. You know, I was... I was uh, standing here during worship and I was thinking how uh, realistically uh, you have three options when you consider what to do with your life. Uh, you can waste it, you can spend it, or you can invest it. Now think about that. You can waste it and many people do absolutely nothing with their lives. They simply exist, taken up space and using up air. Come on, don't look at them if they're sitting next to you. And then you can spend it. Think about that, right? You can give yourself to a career, to a hobby, to an experience, any kind of pursuit that captures your heart. But then you can invest it. I really believe the best use of your life on earth is to invest it in something that will outlast it. And I say all of that to say this, to your pastors, uh, pastors Galen and Talitha, to the entire uh, Cornerstone Church leadership 
team to pastors Mari and Gail who by the way they're some of our coaches and to to all of you this incredible family I want to say thank you I just I just want to say thank you you know sometimes I'll go preach at a conference or a church and people will come to me they'll say oh thank you for your ministry but I just want to stop tonight and I want to say thank you I want to thank all of you thank you for investing your lives not wasting them not spending them but investing them in something that will outlast them so I want you to do me a favor I don't want to bother you tonight but I want you to do me a favor and just give a good hand clap to everybody in this room come on Lottie Dottie and everybody come on just give a good hand clap matter of fact tell the person on your right and left just tell them thank you would you I wish I could tell every one of you thank you thank you pastors thank you thank you thank you if I did anything right in my life it was when I gave my heart to this girl right here 25 years ago I married my high school sweetheart my high school sweetheart y'all and uh, and I'm so happy she's with me Kim would you just stand up turn around and wave I want everybody to see you come on this is my wife Kim she came to hang out and I don't know if they have a picture of my family. I, I want you to see my family. Uh, yeah, there we are. That's my daughter, Kyla. She's 21 this year, and uh, she's getting married in October. That's my son, Cade. He's 17. Both my kids uh, work with me on our team. I'm telling you, I, I'm so grateful for uh, the family. You know what? I've... I've, uh, I've never done this before, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to shift gears here. I, I really feel led of the Lord to, to do something, even as I'm talking about family. I've never done this. And I, I, something went off in me on the plane, and I'm just going to go with it. So I'll do it Friday night. I won't do it this Sunday. But how many of you are parents? Raise your hand. Okay. Put your hand down. Now, I'm not just talking about having young babies with diapers to change. I'm, I'm talking about the whole spectrum from, from tiny babies developing in the womb to dealing with tantrum throwing toddlers to handling rebellious teenagers to managing young adults maybe who have walked away I don't know if you're here but young adults who have walked away from the church and you're dealing with complex um, relational issues I just feel this tonight maybe even addictions um, if, if this describes what you're dealing with and you are a parent I don't care who you are if you're a parent raise your hand right now raise it up high okay um, if it's all right pastor I'm gonna go with this for just a moment I have a word I believe from the Lord for you tonight parent I want you to stand up if you raised your hand I want you to stand up if you raised your hand now I'm I'm really gonna bother you now I want you to walk forward I want you to walk forward I've never done this before but I feel like I have a word for you and, and I want you to walk forward. Um, yeah, and give a good hand clap to all these parents. Would you do that, please? Come on, you can do better than that, y'all. And, and if you would do me a favor, just come close. Come, come, come together this way and come together this way. I, I'm telling you, I've never gone this way before. I have a really, I've got a really good word for you tonight, but I feel like I got to go with the Lord on this. As a matter of fact, Kim, would you come up here real quick um, with me? Um, I, I want you to look at me. Um, a couple of things I want you to know tonight, and I'm just going to go with it. One, I would say is this, parent, um, you aren't alone. Uh, two, I would say this, uh, that I felt led today while we were flying here from, from Dallas. I was preaching a conference this morning. 
we caught a flight this afternoon to be here tonight and while I was on the way here I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to pause tonight I didn't know if I was going to do it but while I was talking about my family I just felt like I needed to do it and so I, I, I want to pray specifically for you tonight and I want you to listen I have a word for you and it's a promise that comes from um, Isaiah 54 verse number 13 and this promise is for you tonight, parent, and I want you to hear what the Lord is saying to you tonight. I'm so glad you're here because this is for you. I really believe it. So, parent, I want you to hear. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. Listen to this. And great shall be the peace of your children. Okay, listen. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Y'all, I've never done this before, but I want you to lift your hands. I declare that your children shall have peace and their peace shall be great. I'm going to say that again. I declare that your children shall have peace and their peace shall be great. Now, if you believe it and receive it, clap your hands and give God praise. Wow. Okay. Now, now check this out. The, the, the Hebrew word for peace there is actually shalom, which means this, completeness, soundness, welfare, and peace today. Whatever your children may be going through. <laughs> You can stand on this promise that your children can be completely healthy, whole, and well. And parent, hear me. You can lay hold of this truth that they can walk in supernatural peace. Even if the circumstances around them right now may not look good. Do you know why your children can walk on this promise of having great shalom? I'm going to tell you why. Because Isaiah 54, watch this, comes before, don't you miss this, now this is a shocker, but Isaiah 54 comes before Isaiah 53. And what's Isaiah 53 all about? Okay, it's all about the work of Jesus at the cross. And I want you to read it this week, parent, because here's the deal, here's what I felt. You didn't realize you're going to come tonight and walk out of here free, but here's what I felt. Some of you are blaming yourselves for some of the things that your children are going through. Right now, you're blaming yourself, I don't care who you are, for some of the things that your children are going through right now. I don't, I don't know what it is, it doesn't even matter, but m maybe you're angry with yourself because you say, I didn't spend enough time with them when they were younger, or not taking enough vitamins, you know, when, when I was pregnant, or maybe I was, you know, smoking and drinking when I was pregnant, or whatever, or, or maybe, you know, I lost my temper with them over and over again. And some of you even blame yourself for their behavior today because your marriage ended in divorce but I had to stop tonight I've never done this before and listen whatever may have happened in the past the Spirit of the Lord says tonight don't remember the former things as a matter of fact he says forget the things of old behold he says he will do a new thing and whatever you've done or failed to do your children can have an intimate walk with the Lord. And what does Isaiah 54, 13 say? Watch. They can be taught by him and be blessed with great shalom in every area of their lives. And here's the kicker. There's a reason why I talked about 53. Here's the kicker. I'm a gospel preacher. I don't preach good advice. I preach good news. Okay, listen, the promise that I just spoke over your children has nothing to do with you. 
It has everything to do with Jesus and what he did on the cross. Listen. He was despised and rejected so that your children can be loved and accepted. Okay. He bore grief and carried their sorrows. Why? So that they will never have to bear them themselves. I see you, mother. He was oppressed so that they need never come under, and I declare this over your children now, under any mental oppression or tormenting stress. The chastisement of their peace was upon him, and by his stripes they are healed. Yeah. Parents, do me a favor. I know I'm taking a lot of time on this, but do me a favor. Take your hands, open them up, and look at them. Are you ready? Your hands are way too small. Yeah. There's so much. Look at them. I just want to remind you, there is so much you can't do for your children. There is so much you cannot do for your children. And this is why I'm using this moment to point you to Jesus. Trust him with everything, including your children. Point your children to him. Let him take care of them. Encourage your children to trust him too. As a matter of fact, here's what I want you to do. Lift those hands in the air. Would you do that? I pray even now in the name of Jesus, your heart will be more and more and more established in knowing that because of what Jesus has done on the cross, I declare now your children can be blessed in every area of their lives. Just as the children of Israel experienced supernatural light in their dwellings, when all of Egypt was en enveloped, the Bible says, in darkness, may you and your children also experience the Lord's protection and supernatural light. Light, even in these very dark times that, yeah, we're living in, I get it, but in the name of Jesus, I declare now, every parent with uplifted hands, I declare blessing upon you. I declare blessing upon your household. I declare that your days and the days of your children shall be as the days of heaven upon earth. I declare that whatever the enemy meant for evil in the lives of your children, I declare God will turn it around and cause all things to work together for their good and for his glory. Keep those hands lifted. Father, I thank you so much that you order our steps, and Lord, you also order our children's steps, Lord. I also thank you that you surround us on all sides. You surround our kids on all sides. Yes. You go before them. You gird them up from behind. And Lord, I just ask tonight that you would bring healing over every parent's heart that's been broken because of guilt or shame that they have put upon themselves. Lord, I thank you, God, that you are a God of freedom. I thank you, Lord, that you don't ask us to carry heavy burdens, Lord, but you exchange that burden for a light burden, Lord. You, you protect you love our kids even more than we do. And so, God, I just pray that you would just take off of their shoulders any weighty load that they have heaped upon themselves for good or bad parenting, for lacking to protect the way they felt they should, lacking um, the provision that they thought they should provide. Lord, I thank you that you are our source, you are our defender, you are our protector. And, Lord, we thank you that you have a purpose and a plan that absolutely astounds and blow our, blows our minds for our own kids. We thank you in Jesus' name for all that you're going to do. Amen. Well, parents, if you believe it and receive it, clap your hands and give God. I want you to give them the best praise right now. If you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for your children right now. Come on. Come on. Woo. All right, y'all, you can be seated. And give these parents a good hand clap. Would you do that? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Well, pastor, is that it? Can I preach something else? Huh? Y'all ready for God's word? Somebody say yes. I want you to take your Bibles. Go with me, please, tonight to Romans 5. Go with me to Romans 5. 
I want to look at one verse of Scripture, verse number 17, Romans 5, verse number 17. This is what Paul writes, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Now, I don't want to bother anybody, but if you would just lift up your hands in his presence, Father, for the next few moments, I am not trying to change the people in this room. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Only you can minister to their hearts. So today, I simply preach your abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness. I plant and water, you give the increase. I proclaim Jesus. I point the people to Jesus. And you do the rest. Father, I thank you that you are raising up true apostles and prophets who have more than just titles, but who continue to lay the foundation, like Paul determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified, who restore people to their first love, no longer being motivated by the law, but by love. So today I will bless, not curse. I will speak from a mercy seat, not a judgment seat. I will speak to the people's potential, not to their problem. I will mentor them, not torment them. I will declare their righteousness, not bring their sin to remembrance. I will build up, not tear down. I will teach them to rest and not wrestle. In Jesus' name, I thank you and I give you praise. We all said together, amen. Ah, oh, yeah, okay, so... Um, Childhood, right? Anybody remember that? Uh, childhood, right? So many, uh, so many awesome Disney movies, right? Uh, Y'all remember Disney movies? Wave at me. Come on. How about uh, Sleeping Beauty? Anybody remember that? Sleeping Beauty. Or how about The Jungle Book? The Jungle Book. What about Alice in Wonderland? Yeah. The Lion King. Y'all remember that? The Lion King. I can't watch that movie because my eighth grade girlfriend broke up with me after we went and saw The Lion King. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 101 Dalmatians, uh, Toy Story, Finding Nemo, I mean, we could go on and on. The Incredibles, right? Despicable Me, Frozen, right? Okay, now this is going to date me, okay? But one of my favorite Disney movies when I was a kid, y'all don't know about this, was The Sword in the Stone. Okay, okay. Y'all remember that? Okay, so, 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 real quick, after a king dies, right, leaving no heir to the throne, this sword magically appears inside a stone, and the sword uh, bears an inscription proclaiming, uh, remember this, whoso pulleth this sword of this stone is right wise king. Well, no one could remove the stone or the, the sword from the stone, which was eventually forgotten. And then years later, this 12-year-old orphan boy, right, pulls the sword from the stone. And that one magical act is what got him crowned king. Y'all remember that movie? And I'm going to tell you, I love stories of orphans moved 
to the palace. I am a sucker for stuff like that, and I know you are too. Come on, girls love Cinderella. Guys, come on, love Creed. And these are all basically, I'm going to tell you why we love it, because they're all basically the same plot line. And here it is. Someone with no power, no future, defies all odds, wins in life, and lives happily ever after. We love we love these stories. One modern day theologian said it like this. We started from the bottom. Come on, now we're here. And the reason we love these stories, church, you better hear me, is because God wired us to reign in life. Church, you have been wired by God terrain in life. I want to talk about it real quick, see how far we can go. And then there's some things I really believe prophetically I want to speak over this house. Um, but I want you to rewind real quick to the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. Remember this in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Pleasure. And Genesis 1.28 says it like this, watch, God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, watch, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule, look at this, rule, rule, reign, have dominion. I hope you see it, that God's heart was for us to rule, to have dominion over this earth, and the Bible says everything in it. We were to reign as kings over this world, but then, okay, a sad thing happened, right? Here's the deal. Our crown was stolen, yeah. And we traded our royalty, the Bible says, for a piece of bad fruit. We exchanged our place of privilege, right, for struggle, for sinful struggle. And we didn't trust God, and we ate from the tree we were supposed to leave alone, the tree of morality, the tree of good, don't miss this, the tree of good and evil. A whole lot of churches eat from that tree, morality, good and evil. Well, watch, there is a way that seems good to man, but the end is even death. Why? Because we're not eating from another tree called life, which is the Christ life. And so through our actions, watch this, we said, God, we're better off without you. How many of you know that's a big mistake? Come on. And, and if, if we trusted him, we would have lived, but we chose to distrust him. And the Bible says that we reap the awful consequences of our own choice choice and what happened? We stopped reigning in this life. And I'll tell you right now that many people think that God rejected us in the garden, but it's the other way around. We rejected God. God did not run and hide from us. You better hear me. We ran and hid from Him. And by snubbing Him, here's what we did. We cut ourselves off from the source of life. And the Bible says when we did, don't you miss this, we died. And from that moment on, I'm just trying to lay a foundation, y'all. From that moment on, the Bible says, death reigned on the earth, sin reigned on the earth, pain reigned on the earth, disease reigned on the earth. We went from reigning in life, watch this, to life now reigning over us. And I'm going to tell you that this grieved the heart of God because this was never His intent for us. He had higher hopes for His children than the bondage of sin and death. Now that's the bad news, and I had to lay this foundation because I hope you're ready for good news. I am a good news preacher. I am a preacher committed not to preaching what's wrong with you and Adam. I only preach what's right with you in Christ. And the reason why is because when I preach the gospel, faith comes alive. Good advice does not bring faith, only the gospel brings faith. When you hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it, and I want you to get this because I'm going to warn you, I'm a good news preacher, and how many of you know the gospel is good news? Come on. Not bad news, good news. And you better beware, I'm telling you, because much of what's sold today as the gospel is an inferior substitute for the real thing. And can I tell you, please, do not be fooled by cheap knockoff gospel. 
Gospels, and there is an easy way to distinguish if it is authentic from the counterfeit, because the true gospel is 100% good news. There is no bad news in the good news, and if the gospel you've bought into makes you feel insecure, makes you feel anxious, makes you feel guilty, makes you feel shameful, makes you feel condemned, makes you feel depressed, that is no good news. As a matter of fact, you better get rid of it before it kills you. And if you're thankful for good news, I don't want to bother you, but would you clap your hands and give God praise? Come on. Here's the good news. At just the right time, the Bible says, God came to earth in the form of a human. The Bible says he died, watch this, on the cross, rose again three days to prove what? Three days later to prove that God's grace is greater than the bondage of sin and death. And I'm so glad he didn't just come for you. You better get this. He came as you. His death was your death. His burial was your burial, his resurrection. Oh, God is your resurrection. His reigning is now your reigning. Jesus bore our sin that we might bear his righteousness. And that simply means this. Lift up your hands. I declare over you now, you are not guilty. You are entirely pleasing to God. And if you believe it and receive it, clap your hands and give God praise. Come on. It's Friday night. Somebody wake up. Feel like throwing a party. If our sin had been too much for him to carry, oh God, he'd still be dead and we'd still be sinners. But Christ has been raised. The Bible says, proving what? Proving that any claim sin had against us has been fully settled once and for all. How many of you know that's good news? The good news declares our sin can't condemn us. <laughs> Why? Because there's uh, no condemnation, the Bible says, to those who are in Christ. Why? Because there's no more sin to condemn. And, and that's the story of the gospel. I'm trying to tell you, Adam <laughs> had a garden that turned into a graveyard, but Jesus took a graveyard. Okay. <laughs> and he turned it into a garden. Okay, I'm waiting for somebody to wake up. Adam had a tree of life, but he turned it into, he chose, yeah, a tree of death. Jesus chose a tree of death and turned it into, oh God, I could stay here all night, a tree of life. Okay, let me give you the gospel in like 15 words, and I want to declare it right now. Here it is. Yeah, your crown was stolen in the garden but it was restored at the cross oh God I'm going to try that again somebody should have woke up right there your crown might have been stolen at the garden watch this but it was restored at the cross and if you thank God for restoration give him the best praise you've given him all night come on hey more than before thank you Jesus Are y'all getting this? This is how our theme verse says it. Y'all, if you don't know, I'm pretty passionate about good news. (laughs) This is how our theme verse says it. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. Stop right there. In other words, because of Adam, death reigned on the earth. Pick it up. How much more? Well, those who receive (laughs) by faith, by the way, God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, (laughs) Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. I talked about first Adam, but then I talked about last Adam. I didn't say second Adam because if there was a second Adam, there'd be a third. There is no third. Last Adam, Jesus Christ, we reign. Notice, grace leads to righteousness. Righteousness does not lead to grace. Okay. I may pick up there Sunday. I don't know. Because of Jesus and his gift 
of grace and righteousness once again. We get to reign in life. Yeah. And by the way, can I just say, we don't reign. We don't just reign someday in the afterlife. We reign, the Bible says, thank you, in this life. We don't just reign in the sweet by and by. Can I give you good news today, church? We reign right here in the nasty here and now. And can I tell you that the gospel is much more than how do I get from here on this earth to heaven? It's about how do I get what's happening in heaven to operate here in in the earth thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it already is done in heaven we are restored the Bible says to righteous royalty I just stopped by tonight to ask somebody do you know who you are oh God see that's what the gospel will do it'll unveil who you truly are that's why I hold up Jesus. He's called a mirror, and I'm going to tell you why. How many of you with a show of hands have ever seen your face? Let me see. If you've ever seen your face, wave at me if you've ever seen your face. Put your hand down. Every one of you are wrong. Your eyes have never looked at your face. You've only seen a reflection. You've never seen your natural face. What do you need? A mirror. Watch this. You've never seen your born-again spirit. What do you need? A mirror. That's why Jesus is called a mirror. You know what religion does? It gives us a distorted mirror. But when you preach Jesus and lift up Jesus, the Bible says you get a glimpse into a mirror. Don't you miss this? You get to see who you truly are. And what God has always believed true about you, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is a revelation of what God has always believed true about you. <laughs> oh God, sometimes I just want to sit on the front row and take notes of myself because I bless myself. <laughs> y'all, y'all, please don't miss this. Oh God. What's he called? He's called the Word. Why? Because if you want to know what's on my mind, don't you miss this, you'll never know what's on my mind if I don't give you a Word. Do you want to know why Jesus is called the Word? Because God gave a Word. He is what he's always believed true about you. As Jesus is, so am I in this, in this, in this world. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? You're righteous royalty. Oh God, yeah, I wish you'd believe that. Because here's the big question, and I'm going somewhere, I'm going to get there. But here's the big question, watch. You hear me say, we've been restored to righteous, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've been restored to rights. Yeah. Okay. If that's true, why are so many of you still living like orphans when God's restored you to the palace as sons? If that's true, why do so many of us, yeah, I'm talking about us, not them, us. Not them, us. You know who needs the gospel? See, I grew up in religion, so we always said the gospel was for them out there. No, listen to me. The more I come into a revelation of the gospel, let me tell you, you know who needs the gospel? The church. And we love talking about the prodigal son, but don't forget, it's actually a story about two sons. One son was lost in religion, don't you miss this, just like one was lost in rebellion. One may have gone to the pig pen and didn't know the heart of the father, but you better hear me. There was another one who never left the house, and don't you miss this, he didn't know the heart of the father either. And if you want to know how the story ends, the story ends actually with the son who was on the outside, on the inside, and the one who was always on the inside, on the outside. You know what I believe, church? The ones who think they're actually close may be the ones who are farther away than they You know who needs the gospel? 
You do. You know who needs the gospel? The church, because we're struggling with what I call functional gospel amnesia. Let me tell you what I mean. We don't even believe the gospel we tell other people. And maybe that's why Paul said over and over and over and over and over and over again, church, you better preach this thing to yourselves. Yeah. And that's my question. Why are so many of us living like orphans when God restored us to the palace as sons? And y'all, y'all remember this now. Let me, let, me, let me just go there real quick. Is anybody getting anything tonight? Just wave at me. This is Friday night. It's supposed to be party night. Come on. So, so remember this right after promising the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus said, I think it's John 14, 17, 18, something there. He said this. I will not leave you orphans. Do you know what an orphan is, church? It's a fatherless child. And Jesus was saying, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but somebody needs to hear this. You are not an orphan. You are not that person. You aren't an orphan, you are a son. And can I tell you, there is a major difference, watch this, between an orphan spirit and the spirit of sonship. And the longer I'm in this thing, I'm realizing that's what I'm dealing with. In this culture, the people we're beating up, most of the time in the church, we show up like Roman soldiers ready to break people's legs. I don't show up like a Roman soldier ready to break anybody's legs. You know why they broke Jesus' legs? To try to kill him faster. When you know the gospel, you realize, I don't have to show up like a Roman soldier to break your legs. Because when you get a revelation of the gospel, you realize it's not a slow death. You've already died. So reckon yourself dead to sin. Oh, God. And now alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Religion is a slow form of suicide. It's you spending all of your time trying to kill yourself, and you don't have a revelation that you already died. And now you're already alive. So guess what? If you know you're dead and now alive, I don't want to mess with you, but guess what? That's where the church says, well, now what do we do? I don't know. How about live? (laughs) Well, I don't know. See, we don't know what to do in the church. I mean, it's like, what does that mean, live? I don't know. What do you want to do? How about enjoy your life? (laughs) I don't. I don't know, start having fun with your family. Go to Starbucks. I don't know, what do you want to do? Write a big check to your church. I mean, live. Do whatever you want. Do, do whatever you want. Live. Live. I think the church would make a great impact in this world if we just start living. Aren't you glad Jesus said, I came to give you life? He didn't say, I came to give you religion. He said, I came to give you life. See, some of us, We've always taught Jesus came to make bad people good. Nope, he came to make dead people alive. Yeah. Are y'all getting this? It's awfully quiet up in here. But there is a major difference between an orphan spirit and the spirit of sonship. I don't have time to teach on this tonight, but the orphan spirit, because I'm talking to some of you right now, but the orphan spirit, watch, operates out of insecurity and jealousy. Some of the most insecure and jealous people I've ever met, watch, they're not out there, they're in here. The spirit of sonship function out of love and acceptance. An orphan spirit, watch, serves God to earn the Father's favor and love. Watch this. But the spirit of sonship serves God, watch, out of a sense of divine acceptance and favor. You know what I teach at our church? We don't have to do this. Don't you miss this? We get to. Yeah. An orphan spirit, watch this, is in competition with others, but the spirit of sonship always believes in others. An orphan spirit lacks identity. For the spirit of sonship walks in Christ's identity. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. I mean, I'm telling you, I could go on and on and on. You consider the contrast of these two identities this way. Watch this. Spirit of sonship, secure. The orphan spirit, insecure. Spirit of sonship, trusting. Look at this. Orphan spirit, mistrustful. Look at this. Sonship, relationship oriented. I could go on. Orphan spirit, performance oriented. Spirit of sonship. Look at this. Transparent. Orphan spirit, ashamed. Spirit of sonship, self-accepting. One. 
self-rejecting. Another practices dominion. Look at this. Another practices manipulation. One faith-based. Another fear-based. One works creatively. Another toils in bondage. One lives with purpose and destiny. Another lives with conflicting passions. One has a sense of belonging. Watch this. Another has a sense of alienation. One blessed conscious. Another cursed conscious. One focused on supply. Another one on demand. Are y'all getting this? Which one are you? Do you know who you are? That's why I think the Bible says this, Revelation 1, um, uh, verse number 5 and 6, it says this, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, has made us, has, past tense, made us kings. When Jesus died, what does it say? When he died, his blood washed away our sins, moved us back to a place of dominion where now we what? Rule as kings in life. Now, if there's one point, y'all, I really only have one point to this message, and here it is. One point I want you to get today. Watch this. Take your hands right now like you're setting a crown on your head. Come on, you got to work this with me. Come on. Take a crown like you're setting it on your head. Okay, we're going to do it together. Are you ready? Here we go. All right, here's your point. Don't you miss this. And after I give it to you, you better give God the best praise you've given. At Calvary, by this time, we'd be doing about seven laps. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Here we go. Work with me. When the crown of thorns went on Christ said, don't you miss this, the crown of royalty went on yours. <laughs> when the crown of thorns went on Christ's head, here we go, the crown of royalty went on yours. I don't want to mess with you, but I want to hear some kings give God praise like you really believe it. Them. Do you know who you are? Come on. Woo. How about tap the other one and say, you better check yourself. Say this. Do you know who you're sitting next to? Come on. Do you know who you're sitting next to? Oh, God. Do you know who you're sitting next to? Oh. Are y'all getting this? Somebody say yes. Woo. When the crown of thorns went on Christ's head. The crown of royalty went on mine. Yeah. From the crown of thorns to a crown of royalty. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, I declare it over you now. You are righteous royalty. Lift up your hands and say it out loud with all you've got. Say, I am. am. No, I said, say it with all you've got. Say, I am am. righteous royalty. Say it again. Don't worry about the person on your right, left, person in front of you, behind you. I don't even care if you spit on their neck. Say it out loud. Say, I am am righteous royalty. royalty. Now, if you really believe it, give God praise like you do. Come on. I didn't say do it because you feel it. Do it by faith because you know it's already done. I am righteous royalty. This was granted to me by Christ Jesus, right? That thought right there changes everything, church. And this is a pretty big deal. It's what makes the gospel so powerful. That's why Paul said in Romans 1, he said that the power of the gospel is what? A righteousness that is revealed by faith, not by works. Trusting, not trying. Resting, not wrestling. Oh, God. Okay, I got to leave that right there. Okay, now, this is where some of you are thinking, okay, so what? What's this all about? So what? Okay, why does this matter so much? The answer is simple. Let me speak this over this church. If you change the way you see yourself, you will change the trajectory of your life. If you change the way you see yourself, you will change the trajectory of your life. I'm telling you, what I'm speaking over you right now, I've been in a seven-year process of walking this out. See, our beliefs determine our behavior. Behavior is a byproduct of identity. And the problem is this, a lot of stuff we believe, watch, it's not true. 
So we're acting on false information about ourselves. See, we all grow up, the Bible says, with a distorted image of ourselves that comes from wherever. Your preacher, your parents, other people, your peers, your problems, whatever. And they reflected back to us how we began to see ourselves. And some of you, I'm telling you tonight, you can remember the things that were said to you. As a matter of fact, there are, there are people sitting in here, 45, 50, 55, 60, 70. I've had men in their 80s come to me weeping, watch this, because of something that was spoken over them when they were 12. You failure, loser, not enough, useless. How sad is this? A lot of that we got from nose-punching preachers. You're dirty, you're distant, all this kind of stuff. And you just filed that stuff away in your mind, and now you've been acting on that information for a long time. But the reason why I preach the gospel, and by the way, this has nothing to do with your born-again spirit, because the Bible says you're not transformed by your spirit. It says you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, not your spirit. As Jesus is, so are you. That's speaking of your born-again spirit. The issue is not your spirit. Listen to me. The issue is an unrenewed mind. That's why I don't, I, I don't talk about spiritual growth, it, because your spirit is as Jesus is. The issue is not spiritual growth. The issue is soul growth. Soul growth. The issue is you beginning to believe, watch this, what God already believes. You beginning to believe what God already believes. That's why you change your mind, watch this, you change your life. Where the mind goes, that's where the man follows. What you think about is what you bring about. That's why confession, true biblical confession, is absolutely necessary. Because when you confess, you're agreeing with God. And watch this, you can either agree with all the false information, watch this, or you can agree with God. Why do you think uh, Paul wrote to a young son in ministry and said something like this? When you are faithless. He remains faithful. And then one of my favorite verses of Scripture, watch. When you deny Him, He denies you. And those punching preachers love to use that verse of Scripture like, you better not deny God or He'll deny you. That's not what it even says. Deny. Do you know what it's translated? Contradict. Don't you miss this. When you contradict Him, He's contradicting you. Do you know how many of us spend our lives contradicting God? I'm not worthy. And he says, no, I contradict you. You are in the beloved. I'm not close to God. Nope. You are in the beloved. I'm so dirty. Nope. I contradict you. I've taken out the old heart and I've put a new clean heart in you. Do you see the contradiction? And you apply this back to me when I was a new Christian. I had a brand new spirit, but watch this. I had an unrenewed mind. And you know what my desire is tonight? That you begin to believe as you hear the gospel what God believes true about you. And I'm telling you, church, as you begin to get a hold of this, you're going to understand that you have Christ's power, that you have Christ's authority, that because of Jesus, you have power and authority over Satan, that because of Jesus, you have power and authority over sin, that because of Jesus, you have power and authority over every situation and I don't want to bother you tonight but if you're thankful for that give them a good hand clap of praise come on like you really believe it you got do you know who you are you got not a weak power but resurrection power the same power that raised Christ from the dead church if you really believe that watch this you could flip this city upside down overnight Watch, you'd stop begging for power and recognize you got a power plant in your belly. Woo. Here's what I felt tonight, and this is it, I'm done. There's so much I wanted to say on this, but I'll come back this, this Sunday. Take that crown again, let's do it again, come on. When the crown of thorns, come on, went on Christ's head, the crown of royalty 
went on mine. Come on, with that crown on your head, say it out loud. Say, I'm destined to reign. Come on, say it. I'm destined to reign. As a matter of fact, I don't know what you're looking at right now that you're saying, it's raining over me. But I declare when you walk out of this place, no longer is it raining over you, but you are reigning over it. When the crown of thorn went on Christ's head, the crown of royalty went on yours. What if you really believe that? Yeah. What if you really believe that? Now, here's what I'm going to do. If it's all right, everybody stand with me right now. This is it. Everybody stand with me. I need, I, I need the musicians to help me because this is going to be a moment, I believe, prophetically. I'm going to speak some things over some of you if you're ready. And here's what's going to happen. I want to prophesy. Now, watch this. I want to prophesy Psalm 23 over you. Now, some of you say, Psalm 23, well, isn't that just a psalm that we, that we quote at funerals? No, it's a revelation of Jesus. I'm going to prophesy Psalm 23 over you, and David wrote it, and, and what if we really believe, what if we really live like righteous royal? what if we reigned like a king? Because don't forget, David, who by the way, wrote Psalm 23, wrote a chapter on the confidence that he had in a revelation of his best friend, or by the way. Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd, and in him I want nothing, I lack nothing. Now, isn't this crazy? Here he is in the old covenant, don't you miss this, in the old covenant, and he had a greater revelation of Jesus than most in the new covenant. Because watch this, he said, the Lord is my best friend, my shepherd, watch this, and in him I want nothing. Can I tell you, most churches I go to, all I hear is faithless language faithless singing, begging God to do what He's already done. God, please split the heavens and come down. And I can hear Him saying, I already did. God, please, I want to get close to you. And He says, how do I get any closer? I'm in you. It's just faithless because we're not convinced of what God's already convinced of. And here's David under the Old Covenant who had a greater revelation than most of us. And he wrote Psalm 23, which is a revelation of Jesus. And he reigned in life. And by the way, he was a king. And I wish some of you tonight would walk out of this place. And here's what the Spirit of God spoke to my heart, that tonight some of you that have been living below your means, you better get ready because you're walking out of this place. Watch this. And whatever's been reigning over you, here's what the Spirit of God says, it's not going to reign over you but you're going to reign over it. And here's what the Lord spoke to me. I want you to declare Psalm 23 and prophesy, I believe it's six verses of Scripture, over some people tonight. This may not be for everybody, but I want you to close your eyes for a moment and lift your hands in His presence. And I don't want you to beg for anything. Here's what I want you to do. The greatest statement of faith, watch this, is thank you. As a matter of fact, take a deep breath right now. Yeah, just take a deep breath. Yeah, it just feels good to hear the gospel. Lift up your hands and just begin to thank Him. That's the greatest statement of faith. Thank Him for what you've already got. Yeah. Okay. Don't look around because this may not be for everybody, but I'm going to talk to those of you. I really feel this. A whole lot of stuff has been reigning over you. As a matter of fact, some of you have just said, I've had enough. I don't know I can take any more of this. I, I feel like stuff's just been reigning over me, but tonight I've heard the gospel and I'm ready to reign over it. I don't care what it is. Put your hands down right now, but if I'm talking to you again, your head's just been hung down. You've been looking at the ground. But tonight the Spirit of God says your soul is about to be restored. Yeah. I just declare more than before. Your soul is about to be restored. If I'm talking to you when I count to three, I want you to hold your hand up high because it's not going to rain over you. You're going to rain over it. I'm telling you, it's going to be a different Friday night. Are you ready? One, if I'm talking to you, hold your hand up high. One, two, three. Hold it up high if you're ready to rain. Now, if your hand's lifted, 
Walk to me right now. Walk to me. Every one of you with uplifted hand, walk to me because I'm going to prophesy Psalm 23 over every one of you who's stepping out by faith right now, just trusting God, just taking him at his word that you do reign in life, that life will not reign over you. I don't care what it is. Come on. 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 Yeah. Come on. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Now look at me, those of you that are standing here. This is all I'm going to do. I'm going to speak over you Psalm 23. And as I do, watch this. I really felt God say your soul is going to be restored. You're going to walk out of this place tonight knowing that when the crown of thorns went on Christ's head, watch this, the crown of royalty went on yours. Watch this. I don't want you looking down when I declare this. I want you looking up. Woo. I don't want you looking down. As a matter of fact, I just declare this prophetically. I want you looking up. <laughs> yeah. I want you looking up. You are destined to reign. It is not going to reign over you. I want you lifting up your head. Lift up your head. Lift up your head. Lift up your head. Yeah. I feel like I'm coming tonight like, 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 like Samuel. Like I'm just anointing you. Watch this. To remind you. <laughs> to remind you of who you are. Yeah. You are destined to reign. It is not going to reign over you. As a matter of fact, I just declare this. Psalm 23, yeah, Psalm 23, for the next, for the next 30 seconds before I speak it, lift up your hands and just thank him right now. There's a release of joy. <laughs> yeah, it's not coming from out here, it's coming from in here. Out of your belly will flow rivers of joy. And I hear the Spirit of God say, there's a strength that's being released right now in the name of Jesus. Because when joy... <laughs> is renewed their strength in the name of Jesus lift up your head I speak over you now lift up your head in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus okay here I go I'm just gonna I'm just gonna I'm just gonna declare it and pastor you can come back up here because when I'm done declaring it over you you can shut this thing down any way you want to okay lift up your hands here we go I declare over you now I'm just going verse by verse the the Lord is your shepherd. I prophesy over you now that God feeds you, God guides you, God shields you. You have nothing to fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. I lack nothing. You lack nothing. I declare in Christ, you lack no good thing. God will meet all. I didn't say some. All your needs all he will take care of you don't you live lacking when God says you will not lack come on for the next 15 seconds lift up your hands don't clap just be, just tell him I believe it and I receive it come on that's it I believe it and I receive it he makes me lie down in fresh tender green pastures your life is fresh I declare it now your future is not brown it is not dead it is not stale you will thrive he leads me beside still, this is a word, still, restful, quiet waters. I declare over you now that God gives you supernatural, abundant peace. I prophesy you don't have to live an overworked, burned out, tired life. That is not from God. God is the God of rest. Stop trying. This is a word for someone. Stop trying so hard and start trusting. I hear the Spirit of God say that he will take care of you and your situation. So tonight you leave peacefully in the name of Jesus. He restores your soul. If you are down, if you are discouraged, lift up your head right now. You come to him. He says, I will restore you. I will refresh you. Apart from him, there's not restoration. But in him, I declare restoration. As a matter of fact, more than before, someone standing here right now that have, that's dealt with loss. But I hear the spirit of God say to you now, in the name of of Jesus restoration I declare it over you now if not in quantity then in quality
quality in the name of Jesus. I declare restoration more than before in the name of Jesus. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. I declare over you, Jesus gives you his righteousness as a gift. You don't earn it, you receive it. And I declare you receive all the benefits of his righteousness. You are not guilty. As a matter of fact, with hands lifted, say it out loud. Say, I'm not guilty. Say, I'm entirely pleasing to God. Now, come on, for the next 15 seconds, thank him right now. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, you will fear no evil. For he's with you, his rod and staff, they comfort you. When you face problems, I prophesy, whatever it is, pain, problems, hardship, I declare he never leaves you. He always protects you. He guides you. Notice, you go through. This is a word for someone. Through. Notice I said through. Notice I said through. Notice I said through. You are not staying there. You are going through, which means this. You're coming out the other side. Listen to me. You're not alone. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never abandon you. I'll never quit on you. I'll never walk out on you. I'll never divorce you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Your greatest blessings happen during your greatest opposition. You better hear me. That's a word for you, pastor. Your greatest blessing happens during your greatest opposition. I declare your pain will become your promotion in the name of Jesus. Take your, take your hands right now. Come on, like you're putting that crown on. You anoint my head with oil. I declare over you now, you are royalty. You're a son of the king. You're, a, you're adopted into the family of the king of kings. And as royalty, I declare you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about. Your needs are met. Your future is secure. You walk in honor. You walk in respect. You walk in dignity. As a matter of fact, I declare what David David said, my cup overflows. No matter what size faith you bring to God, he says, I will fill it to overflowing. He abundantly, I prophesy over your family. I prophesy over your ministry. I prophesy over your business. There is an abundant, over-the-top flood in the name of Jesus. Surely goodness and mercy, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. As a matter of fact, I declare over you now a revelation of your father. Father, that God does not chase you down to beat you down. He is not mad at you. He chases you down with goodness and mercy and unending love. And I will dwell in the house. I will dwell. Hey, listen, church, you are the house. I will dwell in him forever. Stay right there. Stay right there as you stay in him. Yeah. You will see these blessings be yours in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus. Now we're going to say it together. When the crown of thorns went on Christ's head, the crown of royalty went on mine. Now for the next 30 seconds, every one of you lift your hands and begin to thank him right now for every word spoken over you and spoken over this house. Come on, for the next 30 seconds, begin to thank him right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. you tonight and we are grateful for who you are but because of who you are we can become all that you've designed and created us to be and we believe your word for us what you've designed for us and we know who we are tonight we are yours and we are your reflection God it's in your image we live and move and breathe and we are grateful for it in Jesus name everyone said amen, amen. everybody said amen, amen. give a praise church